Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. Suffering from COVID-19 doesn't end when patients leave the hospital. Many people who were seriously ill report both physical and psychological problems even after they're cleared to return to their homes. It's called post-intensive care syndrome, and it can lead to big problems. A new support group seeks to help older adults who are in this situation. The groups are part of the University of Missouri-St. Louis, and joining us today to talk about them is Anne Steffen. She's a professor of psychological sciences at UMSL, and a clinical geropsychologist. And Stefan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So I understand you actually had your first support group meeting this morning. How did that go? So it's really um, striking to hear the stories that individuals have in this prolonged recovery f- phase. And, you know, as we watch TV and the media is covering as individuals are leaving the hospital, you know, that's just a part of the story. And we're not seeing um, as much media coverage about this prolonged recovery phase that's so important as individuals continue to get better. So you're not there in the emergency rooms. Um, you're, you're in psychological sciences. What made you realize that these support groups were something St. Louis needed? Well, so um, as we, we've been contacted by several healthcare systems indicating that this piece of psychosocial rehabilitation that's part of prolonged recovery was a, a missing piece of the St. Louis landscape. So individuals from FSM Healthcare contacted Community Psychological Service at UM St. Louis and asked us to begin to develop these. So we contacted the experts at Johns Hopkins and had a series of collaboration Uh, conversations and really developed um, these programs to be able to help individuals as they continue their rehabilitation. Hmm. So are these programs things that have been going on elsewhere in the country where you can draw on their knowledge? Yes, that's right. So many people think that COVID-19, since it's relatively new, then means that we're in uncharted territory. But the research literature on post-intensive care syndrome, which is called PICS, Um, has been growing for more than 10 to 15 years. And so there's a a body of research and development on the types of rehabilitation that individuals need to both handle the physical impairments that come about, but also both mental health concerns and cognitive impairments. So a large number of individuals with severe COVID after hospitalization have um, difficulties in memory and concentration. And so, you know, a a comprehensive rehabilitation process is needed. So this PICS, I I love this little acronym here, this post-intensive care syndrome, it sounds like this well predates um, COVID-19. This is something that is just associated with longer hospital stays in, in general? Well, so it's most associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome. Mm. So um, many people uh, who go into the hospital, not just within intensive care, but who have a serious illness that involves respiratory distress, then upon discharge have a longer recovery period than they may have anticipated at the time that they were discharged. Hmm. And I know this isn't your field, so I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but do we have any idea what it is about that respiratory distress that ends up leading to these types of problems as people are coming out of it? Well, yes, and I I think some of the circumstances of COVID and COVID hospitalizations are contributing to this. So best practices typically when individuals are hospitalized Um, for respiratory difficulties is really to begin physical therapy Mm -hmm. as quickly as possible within the hospital. Sometimes that's not possible to have families there, especially if individuals are disoriented and experiencing delirium. That's not possible. So there's a number of facets of hospitalizations during COVID-19 that's really interfering with what would be common best practices for individuals who are having respiratory distress while they're in the hospital. Hmm. So the isolation that has to go hand in hand with with COVID-19 as as we're now dealing with it, it sounds like that really exacerbates so many of these problems. Yes. And so, so even for individuals who aren't on a ventilator, if they've had to be sedated to be able to be more comfortable, you know, laying prone on their stomachs, which we know helps with um, recovery during 
the acute respiratory phase, um, th uh, that sedation, and, and so both the physical isolation and the social isolation that comes with COVID hospitalizations um, really uh, makes the recovery phase far more difficult. Hmm. So you'd mentioned there are both physical problems and there are psychological ones. And it, it does make sense that somebody going through an illness this severe, of course, they're going to see some physical problems. But, but what are you seeing on the psychological front? Uh, how does that play into it? Well, so both psychological and cognitive. So we'll talk mm -hmm. about both of those. So we're, when we talk about recovery from serious COVID, it's really a triangle um, with these things interrelated. So there's physical, there's mental health concerns, um, oftentimes for individuals with no experience of depression or anxiety before having COVID, um, but upon discharge are experiencing um, anxiety, depression, some post-traumatic stress, uh, certainly sleep impairments that uh, uh, are related to the anxiety. And then, as I indicated, brain health really takes a hit. And so mm -hmm. there's also a number of cognitive impairments that folks need help with their recovery. And, and those cognitive impairments, is that something where um, just having a therapist can help with that? Or is it something where it needs to be a, an MD getting involved? Well, so in the world, so there's a field of rehabilitation psychology that focuses on how the science of psychology, which is a science of behavior change, can be brought to bear as individuals are recovering from physical illness. Um, and so within rehabilitation psychology, we have a, a, a pretty good research basis on helping individuals recover brain health in terms of things that really, you know, our, our brain is a part of our body and very responsive to everything else that's going on both physically and mentally and in our daily lives. And so we actually know a fair amount about some of the things, practices in daily life that can help people in the recovery for their brain health. Like what would be some of those things? Well, certainly um, working with individuals on the schedule of their daily life hmm. and um, being able to maintain their physical and pulmonary rehab, which is so difficult as individuals really are short of breath and have a lot of fatigue and a lot of um, their ability to tolerate exercise is lower. And so the, um, the behavioral sciences bring about helping people manage the pacing that's involved in really sort of scheduling their daily life, um, good sleep hygiene practices, and, as well as working on specific areas of relaxation techniques that will help people to be able to tolerate some of those um, physical, uh, their physical therapy exercises, as well as staying connected with other people. So social engagement's really important for uh, recovering um, brain functioning, and, mm -hmm. you know, the list goes on. So, you know, our brain is an organ, like the rest of our body, and it takes a while to recover from relatively serious illness. So how do you see these new support groups being able to help with that very long list of things that people are going to need um, help with and, and to focus on? Yeah, so, so certainly support is an element, and some of the people who have been calling in and learning about and signing up for the group have indicated that the opportunity to not feel alone in this, the opportunity to link with other patients who've gone through similar experiences was a really important motivation for them. Hmm. And so the group certainly provides an opportunity for people to know that they're not alone and to connect with the experiences of other individuals. Um, but the group as a whole is a psychosocial rehabilitation group. And so we provide education. We work with individuals on um, really identifying some of the daily goals that they have for themselves and um, provide some very sort of structured advice on key pieces related to sleep hygiene, related to uh, connecting with other folks, being able to manage some of the short-term memory impairments that they're having. And so it's it's a structured, there's, there's an education component, there's a support component in people connecting, and there's also a component of helping folks develop really day-to-day -day goals for themselves that will help them stay on track during this prolonged recovery phase. Do you see these groups as, as more of a longer-term commitment, or are people able well, to just pop I, in and have a session or two? Well, so so I think the answer to that is both. We um, uh, 
intentionally designed them as what's called open groups, which means that new people are joining every week and that some people will come in and out in a short term. But certainly, um, we also expect some individuals to stay in for a longer period of time. You know, the, um, the longitudinal research on individuals who've had post-intensive care syndrome, you know, show that the effects of this last three months, one year, and longer for some individuals. And so we know that uh, recovery from COVID-19 for these serious cases, and, and in the case of our group, we're really focusing on individuals who are 50 and older, so not just older adults, but folks who are in the second half of life, so 50 and older, and that they've been hospitalized for at least three nights. Mm. And so for individuals in the St. Louis area, you know, we know that we've had about 4,300 individuals who've been discharged from local hospitals. Wow. And the majority of those individuals were in the hospital for over three nights. Um, so there's going to be some variability in terms of how their recovery is going and um, how much help they need in terms of getting that quality of life and uh, daily living back back to normal for them. And if you're one of those people that, that Anne is describing there, um, our web post about this conversation contains contact information for the UMSL support group. So you can find that on the St. Louis on the Air page. That's at stlpublicradio.org. And Anne Steffen, professor of psychological sciences at UMSL, I want to thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing about this important uh, uh, new group. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm just going to list the number now, which is 314 516 5771. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and thank you so much for doing that. Again, that's 314-516-5771. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.